In many of your Bibles, the heading for this particular chapter is the writing on the wall. Have you ever heard that before? The writing's on the wall. Have you ever heard that, heard that before? This is where it came from. This is the origin of the writing on the wall from over 2,000, I don't know how many millions, 2,000 some years ago, 200 years ago. The writing is on the wall. And most of the time, you know, that's a negative thing. You know, the writing's on the wall. You know? But this morning, it can be a positive thing for you if you recognize the writing. But God is still there to help you to change yeah. if, you, if you allow him to. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't really, you know, in our last block, and no, he showed this last week, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he still didn't get it. And, and, and the, the, the tree that you Noah know, talked about was cut down. His life, you know, he, God said, well, if you're not going to honor me as the one and only God, then I'm taking everything away from you. I'm going to send you out to the fields and have you graze like cattle. Until finally, once he realized and, and honored God, then he was restored. That's the end of chapter 4. And we come to chapter 5, and you know, it's almost the same kind of story again, you know? And I think sometimes it's a story of our own life, isn't it? Where we just don't learn. And you can only go so far and think you can only get away with it so long before you too will see the writing on the wall. And that's not easy to take sometimes because it's hard. Because God's asking you to change. He's asking you to do these things. He's called you to, to, to get, get, get away from something. He's talking about asking you to give up something. He's asking you to get involved in things. And you keep putting them off. And so far, in the first four four chapters of the book we've been reading, that's what's been happening. And they put them off. And God finally put the writing on the wall, which we're going to talk about this morning. The exact date of Daniel 5, I researched it, is October 12, 539 B.C. And not anything but, but no but was there. No was there. No was there. No was there. No was there. So between... Chapter 4 and chapter 5, it's about 25 to 30 years we have kind of in between those two books. Just to give us some, 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 some timeline here. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar died actually in 562 BC. So just to give us some, some insight there. He had a son, Evo Merodach, I think it's called. He reigned for two years in the kingdom before he was assassinated by his brother-in-law, Neragusa. And he died in 556 B.C. So I'm just giving you the lineage of it so we can catch up with the story here. And his son, Labashi Marduk, lasted only nine months before we both placed General uh, Nebuchadnezzar on the throne. And Nebuchadnezzar was not related to Nebuchadnezzar, so to legitimize his right, he married, we think, one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. So he could be right. And then he, he was the king that... Uh, that uh, some books say he just wanted to go on and do his own thing and party and hang out. Others say his health required him to, to leave, the, leave where the, the area they were in and move to the north. That's what he did. He moved to the north. So here we have Babylon. Over here we have Nebuchadnezzar and his little kingdom. And so they left Babylon with Belshazzar. That's where Belshazzar comes in. Now during all this stuff going on, you had the the uh, the Persian or Persians were over here, and the, the Med Med Medes I think are called they're up, they're up here, okay. And Cyrus was part of Cyrus was the was kind of overseeing the, the Medes. So what happened here is is the Medo Persians we talked about that with the statue, you know that dream. They began to take over the kingdom around Babylon because Babylon was was slowly falling. And so over here, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was taken over. So now picture this. Here, here's Belshazzar's. Here's his dilemma. All around him is the Medo Persian people being led by Cyrus. And they're trying to figure out how we can get in there and take over that. Now it's not as easy as you might think. Because the walls there were 58 foot wide. And about 15 feet high, I think it was, the measurements I got. I think there's only one way in and one way out. Okay, so that's pretty hard. So you're gonna they spent some time thinking about it. 
But they were, they, they felt, Belshazzar was feeling closed in. He was felt like he was being surrounded. And he hoped that, his, that, 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 that Nebuchadnezzar could take care of things, but he didn't. Okay, well, where he was. And so, this is a study of what do we do when we're in these tight spots like this? What do we do when we're surrounded by things? And this young king's life is a study of what not to do with responsibility that has been given in your life. And many of us have been given responsibility, but we've done nothing with it. Yeah. A lot of us have been, God's been telling you and nudging you, and we've done nothing with it. I just praise the Sam's group because, you know, Bob was telling me, you know, we can't do much, but you know, every meeting we can, we can get a little bit of money together, and maybe after a few months we can get you that projector you want so fast. So all of us can be used, no matter who you are. Yeah. <laughs> but many of us keep putting it off with all these excuses, and pretty soon, just like Belshazzar, the writing's going to be on the wall for you too. And he was really uh, uh, just a picture of what not to do in a tight spot. Because Belshazzar finds himself in the ultimate tight spot, and his leadership is at this crucial moment in his life. Over thousands of years of Babylonians comes down to him being surrounded here. What does he do? What would you do? Well, if you read that chapter, what he does is he throws a party. Wow. He invites every important decision maker that would come. And, he, and, and the only ones, I think the only ones who didn't come, were the ones who were strategizing how to get out of all this mess. You know? So you can imagine who he had there. And what he does is he... He shakes, he shakes his fist at God. Because if we look back at chapter 1, when they took over, when they took over the, the, the whole kingdom of Babylon there, those different areas, all of the, the, like the goblets and all these different things from the temple in Jerusalem were all brought to his kingdom. He put them in, put, kind of put them in storage. Well, during this party, he said, who cares about this guy? Look at those goblets that we got from Jerusalem. Those ones that are always supposed to be used okay, at the temple. And he got those goblets out, and all of the, the people who were partying got to use them and drink them and, and, and cheer to whatever they were cheering for. I, I have no idea. But you can see how he was shaking his fist at God. And I think sometimes when, when we don't honor God, I think we do the same thing. We shake our it's shaking our fist at him, saying, uh-uh, I know better for my life. And pretty soon, the writing on the wall. You know, his, he, his, the things he did against God were, were, were pretty amazing. But maybe these are lessons we're supposed to learn from this chapter. Here, here's, here's something you might, you, you probably, you, you could learn, I guess, from this chapter. If your father owns a business, don't agree to work for him or take it over when he retires. You might not want to do that. Drinking never solves any kind of problem. <laughs> And when your parents are away, resist the urge to throw a party. Because never, never was, uh, that was his dad. So when your dad's away, don't throw the party, okay? I really don't think these are the lessons that God wants us to learn this morning, but I want to make sure you guys are keeping up with what we were talking about this morning. But what do you do in a tight spot? What do you do when you're in your tight spot? When the world seems to be, like, just coming in on you, crushing you, just, there seems to be no way out for you. Well, I came up with four things that, that has helped me in my life. I think that God has placed on my heart to share with you this morning. And the first one is, you need to begin to take God seriously. Take Him seriously. I love Bud because he says this isn't a game. It's not a game. It's serious. We don't know when the game, the game we're playing is going to change. Yeah. We were talking Wednesday night about, you know, we had a board over here where we listed all of the things we feel like if we were in trouble, and over here if we were, if, if we have comfort, comfort with them all over here. And it's amazing when we're in trouble and there's nowhere to look, nowhere to lean, that's when God has our most attention, doesn't he? Yeah. Right. When things are going real well, we don't even care what the other way. But see, what God's trying to do for us this morning is, we're in this trouble. What are we going to do with it? All he wants us to do is turn around and begin to look at him and 
to listen to him and see the writing on the wall, and he'll do something about it for you before it happens. Even at the last moment, he'll do it for you. And some of you have been playing that game for a long time. So Belshazzar, what does he decide to do? He decides to talk God by drinking from the goblets that were, that were uh, created and dedicated solely for the worship of Yahweh in the temple of Jerusalem. I think sometimes when we're in a tight spot, there's a tendency to want to lash out, blame others, and do something outrageous. We just want to deflect the problem. If I party enough, I'm going to forget about it. If I get mad at somebody else, I'm going to forget about it. If I blame somebody else, I'm going to forget about it. You know what? The problem's still there. That's right. And sometimes I think we need a mirror to look at the problem. So resist the temptation this morning to do that. I think most of this thing about not taking God seriously is just denial on our, on our own part. You don't want to just run or just pretend that the situation really isn't that serious. Some of us even do that, you know. It can't be that serious, so you kind of run from it. I know I'm one of those who just puts it on my mind. It's not a problem. Anybody like that? That's not a problem. I just let it go. But you know what? Over here, that problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if I don't take care of it, the writing's on the wall. God will take care of it for me. So face the situation. Take it seriously. And take God seriously. I think tight spots are moments for our clearest thinking and our most courageous actions if we, if we take time to really, to really ponder on them. And at the moment of our greatest need, resist our urge to criticize or belittle the one, the one who can offer you the most help. There's so many people who, where is my God now? He's right there beside you. Where's my God now? He's got your arm around you. Can't you feel it? Where's my God now? He's speaking those words of encouragement to your, in your ears that you can't hear. Look for him. He's there. Amen. Meditate on him. Find him. Listen to him. In Psalm 121, it says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You can't hide from him. He knows all, sees all, and is all. And he wants to be there for you. Next thing is, expect God to show up. Some of us are wondering, where, where is he? Well, expect him to show up because he's there. No, he's there. No, he's here, but no, he's there. So this, this came to my mind. Man. This, I'm sorry. This is how my mind works sometimes. Wow, I know that came from somewhere. But, but the whole thing is, is the reason I think I said about Noah because Noah and I, Pastor Noah and I have been trying real hard to not just make worship and time with God the same. And we expect now God to be here. We expect God to change. We expect God to transform. We expect God to, 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 to be in your lives. And I think we need to pray those prayers and expect that he's going to be there. I think even, I think even God, I think even God, sometimes he, he's, he's there. And, and what we do is we don't even, we don't even, Oh, he's there. And we, 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 we go through these motions and we, we yeah, that's kind of him, but it's not kind of him. It is him. And he is there. Know that he's there. Do you know that God sees your life on earth as a proven ground for your life to come? The things you're going through, the things that are happening in your life, the experiences, all those things, you kind of wonder why. And I think what God does sometimes is he's, he's, he's looking at us to see, is it all going to add up? And the handwriting on the wall was God's grading system for Belshazzar's behavior, both that night and through his whole life. And most of the issues and problems we have, you know, in, in, in school right now, we're talking, uh, thinking of class on Christian counseling and all this. And, and sometimes in, in this week we had a discussion about how people blame God for their health issues. But why is God doing this to me? Why do I have this disease? 
Well, see, God gives us free will. And sometimes, most of the times, those illnesses aren't from God. Those illnesses are from the world and from the choices you make. That's right. And we can't blame him. But what we can do is hold on to him. Amen. Because, like I said earlier, no matter what's going on in your life, God's going to make good of that. Somehow, some way, something. I had a sister who died way too early. She was two years older than I am. She died about eight years ago, I think now. Two young girls. It was wrong. She had liver cancer. She was gone in a couple months. She died. And we were asking the question, why? The pastor couldn't really answer that question for us, but I'm beginning to understand it more now. Because I don't think my dad would have made heaven unless my sister would have died. Wow. And that hurts. Mm -hmm. But it's not about this life. Yeah. It's about eternity. Jesus. It's about being used now for the sake of the souls being saved later. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. I wish my sister was around. It was a rough time. But I really don't think my dad would have made it to heaven unless my sister would have died. When we go through tough times, we wonder why. You know, you're not going to know maybe going through that right now, but you will at one time or another. God will reveal that to you. I think God is revealing those things to me, to me now. See, God said to Belshazzar, He says, Your days are numbered. And he wrote three things on the wall with his hand, in this party, this, 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 this wall, his hand came out and he started writing this stuff and they're like, whoa, imagine what's going on there at that party when that was happening. And to, and to you know, interpret what he wrote, he wrote, your days are numbered, was the first thing he wrote. Then he wrote, you've been weighed and measured. Wow. But first of all, your days are numbered. All of us, our days are numbered. And for me, my numbers are smaller than most of you. And for you, some of you, your numbers are smaller than, than mine. But we're all our days are numbered. What are we going to do with them? So God writes the second thing he writes. You've been weighed and measured. Uh-oh. How do you think God, your life would look if God weighed it and measured it? What did I do with what was given me? Where did I spend my time? Where did I spend my energy? What was I thinking about most? Was I looking at other people first or me first? When my problem came, was I looking to God or was I looking to, for me to kind of figure it out? And third thing is, he wrote, and now your responsibility will be divided up and given to other people. In Belshazzar's case, he didn't follow through. He didn't, he didn't measure up well. And his days were, no, his days were a couple days here. Because what ended up happening to him is all that he had, the Persian, the better Persians finally came in and took over everything. And he was, he was killed, I think, in a day or two of all that. And Cyrus became the king. And I want to give you a little insight because I was doing some reading about this. And you don't realize how great God is and how much in control of he is in this world. Because 70 years previous, he said he's going to free the Israelites. He's going to, they're, they're going to be freed in 70 years. The day that Cyrus took over, guess what the first thing he did? He freed the slaves to go back to Jerusalem. Exactly 70 years. Not 69, not 72, 70. Yeah. Is that amazing? Yeah. That that could happen? You don't think God's in control? Read the word, study it. It's amazing what comes out of that, of the book. And it just your confidence in him just grows because, wow, he is in control. And so no matter what you're going through this morning, He is in control. And here's some of God's promises about rewards in heaven for, for, for the way you conduct yourself here on earth. And 
I want you to try to identify with God and the rewards here. Go, go over to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. It says, those who are wise will shine like brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. Go over to James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised for those who love him. Praise the Lord. Amen for that one. Wow. I like to, I mean, I love bowls. I love people who put something out in front of me and I go for it. I think that's the way I'm, I'm, I'm kind of built. You know, when I have that in front of me, wow. See, tight spots are the best times for God to judge our faithfulness and our character. And what do we do in those tight spots? And you've heard that character building is done during most of the time and hard times of life. I don't think so. I think we got it wrong. Characters built one right habit and one right decision at a time. Not under one pressure cooker. That pressure cooker equals all those decisions. How are you going to react? And you can start this morning, if you begin to see that writing on the wall, you can start this morning making right decisions. Maybe asking for forgiveness. Maybe coming back to him fully. Maybe answering that call that he's been after you for a while. See, character is built in hard times and is tested in hard times. Or isn't built in hard times, but it's tested in hard times. So God's asking us this morning, how are you going to react? What are you going to do? What values will you exhibit during these times? What resources will you draw upon? Who, who will you look for encouragement from? How will they express your faith? You know, in those tough times, how does our faith, who do we go to? I know some of you are going through some tough stuff right now. But I'm so encouraged because you're not looking outside the church for the answers. Amen. Yeah. You're looking to God first, and you're looking for your fellow Christians and believers and church family to help you. And that's how we're going to get through it together. Because many of us here have been through situations the same. Steve, I have family members who've been through what you're going through right now. I, I, I can't count the numbers. You know, my dad, my uncle, I, mean, I can't, I can and I understand that. That's why our church family is wrapping our arms around you because God has called us together. And that's why we need to encourage you and your wife to hold on. We don't understand it. I know those questions go through my mind too. Why? But he's going to reveal that to us one day. See, God watches closely during our most challenging moments. And He usually responds four different ways to us. When you turn to God in a tight spot, we do know He always responds. Some of us think, well, God never answered my prayer. Yes, He does. He always responds. And God usually has four ways that He can respond. He will either answer no, slow, grow, or go. Most of us don't like the first one. So we don't think he's answering it. Oh, you didn't answer it. Try again, God. We don't like it. And that's what we do. If your request is wrong, he says no. It wouldn't be good for you is what he's saying. Right now it's not good for you. So I'm saying no. Like when Whitney used to ask me, can I go here? No. You darn dad. But I knew best for her. God knows best for you. If your timing is wrong, he says, slow. So I'll answer it, but not yet. Other things need to happen before the request you're asking me to do can be met. And most of us don't like that either. Are you sure? i got to wait a little longer? Why? And if he says, if, if, if you're wrong, he says, Grow. Did you get that? If you are wrong, he says, grow. Take some important steps in your life and grow. Use the situation you're in right now that you're praying for to grow. And if your request is right, the timing's right, and you are right, guess what? 
go. Amen. Amen. Yes. It's not that difficult. God wants to say go, but sometimes it's just not right for you. We're the right time. Where was God for Belshazzar's hour of need? Where was he at? Why didn't he intervene? I bet he was waiting right there next to him with his arms of love out with everything he had to make it better for him. But his character way back here wasn't built to a point where he could answer that right. We'll never know because he turned away from God. And I see others do that almost always result in bitterness towards and hurtfulness toward those around them. That's what happens to us. We get bitter. But God doesn't answer our prayers where we think he should. Third thing is expect God to ask you to make some changes. Uh-oh. He's going to ask you to make some changes. You know, I learned long ago when I used to teach people uh, management skills. I used to always tell them, nothing ever stays the same. Nothing. Think of something right now in your mind. Someone says, a rock stays the same. I go, a rock? Okay, a rock is sitting there out on the ground. Okay, wind's blowing on it, sun and rain. It's going to change. So things are either going to change for the worse or for the better. Yeah. And you have that choice on what direction you want that to go. And we learned in chapter 3 when God showed up and he almost always expects us to change in some way or another. He expects Nebuchadnezzar to change his thinking. And as I've grown as a Christian, God's asked me many, many times to change. I remember one time when he asked me more, how are you spending your time, John? He said, well, I'm watching a lot of sports. I enjoy the life. I spend a lot of time at work because you know, I need to support my family and get ahead. And I spend a lot of time at church, working around the church. And all those things sound pretty decent now. Well, they weren't. I wasn't spending time with the first lady. And I didn't put Christ first. I put the church, my job, my kids, Lakers, and everything else. Look up. But where is you wrong? And he said, you need to change. And if I wouldn't have changed, I saw the writing on the wall. And if I wouldn't have changed, God would she'd have been gone. She didn't need me. And so when my priorities changed, I thought, I could God help me with this. And I reached out wherever I could for help. And he began to change me. And my priorities began to come full circle. And I said, me first. And that was the hard one to put God first. Because I thought, I was working at the church, I'm doing good. I was on the board, Sunday school superintendent, running the youth. I was doing, I was here almost every day, I was cutting the lawn, I was doing it all. I was, I'm working at ch church, I'm doing good. But God wasn't first in my life. Yeah. The church was. And like Brother Dean says, we are the church. Amen. Amen. But I need to understand, Christ is first. Yes. <laughs> then the first lady. Second. Now it gets difficult because the Lakers and the kids, and the kids are all going on. <laughs> Just kidding. Not even Lakers season yet. Just the kids are right there. Kids are, sorry, but the kids are right there. Especially you, baby, right there. <laughs> but I realize how important family, I mean, family is important. But sometimes we put all these other things above Christ, and that's where things get difficult. And you wonder why your life is this way, and you can begin to see that in your mind, you're, that writing on the wall, you begin to see it being written. You, you know where it's going, you know where it's leading you. And man, you're just like, I need to do something about it. And lucky for me, you know, Christ found me again. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he sanctified me, and he changed me. And that's what he's in the business of. And some of you are going through those same things today. We just need to find is give it all up and put him first. 
If you know, often God shows up, it's a modify my character. That, that's what he was doing. In 2008, he asked me to change my vocation. He says, you're enough of that cushy job, traveling around where you want to go, doing whatever you want to do. I want you in the ministry. Twice I said, you've got to go to the store. Twice I said, no way, I got it made. <laughs> I thought I had it made. I did have it made. Because I have more now than I ever had in my whole entire life. Praise God. And I just praise God for that. that He's changing me even at this moment. He's changing me. So when God shows up, you may say, humble yourself. You may say, be kinder. You may say, spend money more carefully or think about other people or less about yourself. But God is in the life-changing business. Amen. He can move you from where you are now to a place of hope, of encouragement, of love. And sometimes it takes some time to get out of where you're at because it didn't take you just a second to get there. You know, it took you a long time of saying no. So sometimes immediately it doesn't happen. For some of us, it does happen immediately. Brother Dean was crazy man. <laughs> I'll think about that. You guys want to talk about it. But instantly at this altar, he got saved and cleansed of everything and never went back to anything. Amen. Sometimes he works that way. For me, I'm on the potter thing and he keeps shaping me, molding me, slapping me down, doing it again. That's how I feel. Yep. <laughs> okay. Some of you feel the same way. You know? Please don't pop me down again, okay? Just keep molding me a little bit at a time. You know? <laughs> In Belshazzar's case, when God showed up because changes weren't made, God had instigated a permanent change in government. And sometimes if God knows we won't change, He'll change our, our, our circumstance. This is called humbling. I've been humble more than I want to be humble, and I don't want to be humble more. That's why I pray. I, I try to beat God to it even though I can't. My, almost every time I pray, God humble me. Because I don't want to be humble. I just continue to keep me humble. Fourth thing is, be sure you're using what you have for God's good as well as your own. Belshazzar had tremendous wealth and power, and he was using it all for his own pleasure. Not for the good of people, not to help anyone but himself. So what did God do? He took it all away. And Jesus tells a story of three men who were given a sum of money by their employer. Two of the three men invested what they were given and doubled it and gave it back to their master. The third didn't do anything with what was given him. And Jesus says that when the master returns, he called the three men in and said, this is the words he said. Take a talent from him who gives, give to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has been given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even one, but what he has will be taken from him. And be taken away if you don't use it. And the principle is this. It's a simple principle. If you prove yourself faithful with what you have, you'll be given more. If you use what you have solely for yourself, you'll lose it. Luke 16, 10 says, Whoever can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have been not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you pro who will give you a little property of your own? Wow. Think of the property that you've been given that you haven't taken. I've been talking to Pastor Noe about our, his dreams are going to have thousands of kids here. And my message to Noe was, well, you need to take care of the ten you have first. Amen. Because God wants to make sure you can handle ten before you need to bring a thousand. And when we do good with our ten, God's going to send more. In the same way, if I can do good with the eight or so, we're going to get more. But you guys are a big part of making that happen. And the older I get, the more I see the importance of money because it's indicating the level of self-discipline and generosity in somebody's life and their love. It really, it really sets us apart of who we really are. Money usually is that last thing we give up. What do I do with what I have is the most accurate indicator of who I really am. Think about that for a moment. What I do with what I have is the most accurate indicator 
of who it really is. And it doesn't matter where you're at. It could be Steve sitting here in a wheelchair at Noble Church. What's he going to do with what he has? And I just see the encouragement that he gives me when I see him here, that, that brightness in his eyes, that smile that looks at me, that he's holding on to God with all he has. Amen. He's doing what he can do with what he has. That's right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And the Lord's going to honor you, brother, for that. Amen. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen. Amen. What he's saying is, if you take care of my business, I'll take care of your business. Mm -hmm. And I found him in my life to be true to his word. Yeah. And he will do that for us. So the Babylonian, Babylon falls, and Belshazzar loses his life. And God brings good out of it all still. We wonder, how does he do that? Well, Cyrus and the Persians set the Jewish people free, allowing them to return to the, the land of Israel. The slaves are finally freed after 70 years. Daniel's too old to be the place that's become his home, and God's plans to use him further there. He's about 80 now. The story of Daniel 5 ends well for everyone except Belshazzar. Because he saw the writing on the wall, and he did nothing about it. We should take time this morning in our own lives and look over these four lessons and see what changes we need to make. Otherwise, the writing's on the wall. Even if you come to church every Sunday, you need to put him first and, and, and abide by him, listen to him, follow him with all you have. You're going to fall. He'll lift you back up. Amen. So take God seriously. Expect God to show up in your life. Expect God to ask you to make some changes. Know what's happening. Don't be surprised if he's going to ask you to do something. That's what business he's in. And whatever he's using, whatever you're using, what he's giving you, make sure you use it for his good. Amen. Because you notice what, else, what I said there? As well as your own. You know how good it feels to give? It feels good to give. Every one of the Sam's group, you guys are so excited. I saw somebody walk in. Oh, wow, that is nice. Oh, wow, that is nice. The projector, because you you could have used that money for something else, but you didn't. You gave. Some of you give your time. Some of you give your, your energy. Some of you guys give your prayers. Some of you guys give your, your time visiting. Some of no. you guys give rides. Sometimes you guys give text messages to each other for encouragement. Whatever you have, give it. Because yeah. he wants it. And it's scary because if we don't, just like our stories in Daniel, are going to come true in your life. Where the writing's on the wall. So would you stand with me this morning? We're going to sing that song to stand. And will you, this morning, just, just ponder these words. And if you want to come down the altar to pray, the only now we're here to pray with you. But just give it all to him this morning. If you're seeing some of that writing, start writing on the wall, give it to him this morning. Ask him for help. He'll, he'll relieve you. He'll send you the right direction.